you for you, church. We're going to worship service here this morning. Worshiping in the Lord. It sounds so good. And you get so many voices praising God together. Just a minor little glimpse of what heaven is going to look like. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to, uh, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, I just have a few verses here this morning, uh, but few, a few verses that have such an impact, um, that have so much sort of packed within them, and uh, a great challenge, um, as well as an encouragement for us here today. So 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, I think I may even have them on my PowerPoint, if I can get my PowerPoint working, or if my crack team of media analysts back there could maybe advance it for me. Did we freeze it? Hey, there you go. Okay, well, you can follow along if you don't have your Bibles here with you. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning of verse 24. The Apostle Paul writes this, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we again are amazed by who you are. Lord, just to... Uh, to think of who you are, your, your characteristics, your, your love, your grace, your mercy, uh, your, your, your eternal uh, existence, your infinite uh, capacity for, um, for power and presence. And uh, Lord, just these things alone are enough to just make us bow our heads in worship. But above all this, your love has come to us. Your love comes to us each and every day. It, it speaks to our hearts. It speaks into our circumstances. And Lord, Lord, only for the ears to hear it some days. But Lord, you have spoke love and you have spoke hope um, as we celebrate this Christmas season of what it means that you have sent your love. You've sent your Son to show us this immeasurable love, this, this um, unimaginable love that your son would take on flesh and be born that child in humble circumstances. Lord, would grow to be an amazing teacher and miracle worker and then would die upon the cross for our sins. For our sins. This is your love that you have for us. And that love needs to change us and transform us. And so, Lord, I pray that as we turn to your word here this morning, that we would be changed, that we would be challenged that we would be encouraged here this morning. Oh, Holy Spirit, come upon us afresh. Lord, help us to welcome you in into the innermost beings and parts of us uh, that we would be changed. So we thank you, Lord. And again, in humbleness, I pray that you would bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and that they would be honoring and glorifying to you and to you alone. And Lord, that you would use them in some small way, Lord, to, to grow your kingdom here in our midst and beyond. Again, I ask this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Growing up, um, my mother used to uh, have a saying every time my, my brothers would start to complain about difficulties and, and challenges in, in our lives, hardships. And she would always say, it's a great life if you don't weaken. Anybody ever heard that saying before? One of you? Perfect. Well, and she's not even sure because she's kind of got this. Uh, all the time, growing up. And, and I don't know why that saying has stuck with me. It's a great life if you don't weaken. So I, this, this kept coming to my mind as I was researching here this week and, and going through over this passage and, and going over our, our story as we get into Pilgrim's Progress again. Um, and so I wanted to do a little research to figure out where the, the origins of this saying came from. Like somebody else must have said it somewhere at some time. Um, and I actually found out it was actually a governor general of Canada that they're attributing to this. Um, and uh, he was, his, actually his name was Sir Buchan. 
Um, and he was actually during the Second World War. And he began to use this saying during that time of war to encourage, um, to, to challenge, to sort of build up uh, the Canada at that time and all those that were heading off into, into war throughout Europe and, and that sort of thing. And it was this is great life, but we don't weaken. We've got to be strong. We're going to get through this. It's going to be okay, right? You, 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 it's going to be okay. We're, we, we can make this happen. And, and I kind of thought, you know, it was, it was quite, a, quite an amazing story then to kind of hear how that took place. It wasn't just me and my brother's pettiness fighting over some, you know, trivial uh, item or, or, or circumstance. But obviously the origins of it had something much deeper. It was a time of war. It was a time of conflict. It was a time of, of turmoil. Right? If we would remember those times of the breakouts of that Second World War, they'd already gone through what they thought was the Great War. And now here we go, you know, so many years later, and it started all over again. And so it really needed to have this, this build-up mentality. And so as we're going to carry on this morning in our Pilgrim's Progress story um, with Christian, I, I want you to keep in mind that saying, it, it's a great life if you don't weaken. It's a great life if you don't weaken. That, that idea to persevere, that idea of endurance is where we're going to be talking about here this morning. Because Paul's message here to the church at Corinth is about persevering. He begins by talking about uh, running a race. He begins to talk about, about this boxing analogy. These were all references to the Olympic Games. Uh, Corinth is not very far from, from Athens, which is where all the Olympic Games started off from. And so the readers of the church in Corinth would have known exactly what Paul is talking about. This running, this race, this boxing analogy, even this, this, this perishable wreath. At that time, there was no gold medals to be hung. Right? You just basically got this little wreath of green leaves and, hey, great, no endorsement deals, no nothing. Right? Good job, way to go. Um, and so Paul is, is talking about this idea, right? We, they're, they're running this race and, and the boxing analogy, and, and he says, you know what, we don't do that. Because we are actually running a race. We are fighting for something that is imperishable. Something that's not going to fade. Something that's not going to rot. Something that's not going to waste away. Something that cannot be touched nor tainted by this world. And so he's trying to encourage this idea of endurance. Stick to this race. Stick to it. Persevere in this. Because you know what? Life is about endurance. Isn't it? Every day, don't we kind of wake up and we're like, oh man, another day, right? Another day of work, another day of jobs and tasks and problems and issues and just another day. And life itself needs endurance. We need to persevere each and every day. You persevered to come here this morning. If you didn't really persevere, you'd still be in bed somewhere, right? You know, but we need this idea of, of, of endurance even in our life. And I don't know if you've been, I don't know how you could not, but our, our lives in this world are getting scarier and scarier every day, isn't it? Right? Every day there seems to be something that is worldwide and is getting closer and closer to home. Right? We've got all kinds of, of terrorist attacks that are happening. Uh, bombs in Paris, shootings in Mali, horrendous acts that have happened um, twice um, in the U.S. And maybe a third time even this morning. I don't know if you heard about this. Uh, there was actually a, a knife attack. Um, I can't remember where it was. Oh, no, sorry, it was in the U.S. It was actually in London. Um, and they're trying to figure out if it was actually a part of a, a terrorist thing as well. Um, and so we just, this whole idea of, you know, why would we even get out of bed some mornings, right? We don't know who to go to, where to trust. Um, this last one, uh, just the, the most horrendous one of, of the last week, was in San Bernardino, California, right? Most of us heard this Christmas office party. Um, and uh, something went awry, and uh, the, the husband and wife came back and just started mowing people down with, with assault rifles. Um, and, and they're not quite sure what, what had taken place. Uh, of course, it's being terrorist-related and all that sort of thing. But did you realize, I found an article this week, that in the U.S. alone, in this year alone, there have been over 350 mass shootings. 350, I think it was like 355 mass shootings. And their definition of mass shootings um, is four, uh, four casualties or, or four deaths. That's their idea of ma 300. Can you imagine? That's, that's amazing. That is amazing. 350 over this last year. Life itself is an endurance race. How do we not succumb to this? How do we not just lock our doors, you know, huddle up in a corner somewhere and just say, that's it, I'm done. 
but we need endurance. We need to persevere. Maybe not as, as traumatic as sort of terrorism things, but we need endurance when it comes to, uh, to, to parenting, when it comes to marriages, when it comes to relationships, it comes to families, getting long over the holidays. We need perseverance, right? We need endurance sometimes when the families get together. We need endurance and perseverance when it comes to finances, right? Just simple everyday things. We need to just keep pressing on. We cannot succumb. We need to have endurance. And again, this doesn't even take into account what Paul is talking about here of running that race of the Christian life. We add that on top of it sometimes because you know what? We're, we're, we're starting to see more and more trials come for the church, the church worldwide, but even the church today, the church in, in our midst, the church in our vicinity. Uh, again, going back to San Bernardino, they're not even sure if this may have been a conflict between a Muslim and a, and a, and a Messianic Jew, a, a follower, a Jewish follower of Christ. It was This is what highlighted this, what escalated it. And again, it doesn't really matter what started it, but obviously there are people who are grieving. There are people who need uh, our prayers and, and our help, and that the church will be mobilized into that. But this idea of endurance, this idea of perseverance, running uh, the rat race at the very least of life, or running the race of the Christian life, Christian life and witness, growing in maturity in order to win, Paul says, that we might win. It's not just that we're kind of in there leisurely, right? We're speed walking through this. Paul says, no, we're to be running it to win. We got to get to that finish line, right? And we don't have time to sort of lollygag. Anybody heard that term? That was another term from my, my past, uh, lollygagging, apparently. I still don't know how to spell it, but all right, Paul says you've got to run the race to win. You have to. And uh, there, there's a start to this race. There's a finish to this race. There's, there's, there's hurdles. There's distractions. There's a course that has been laid out before us. Right? We can, I was always kind of thinking it's not just sort of the, you know, the nice sort of oval track that most people get to, to run on during Olympic Games or something like that. I was thinking more of sort of a cross-country race with rougher terrain and bumps and hills and, and tree trunks that are laying over there and water and, you know, just rained and slippery conditions and all that sort of stuff. This is kind of this race that we are into. It's all kinds of elements and terrains that we face. Um, I was thinking, anybody do cross-country running here? Cross-country racing? Anybody? Isaiah? What sort of things do you encounter when you're running across country? Mud? Okay. Mud. You like the mud, though, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I get dirty, right? But it, do you like it? Do you like the mud? Sandra, come on. <laughs> See, parenting takes endurance. See, yeah, our washing machines take endurance. Um, but we're running a race. It's a cross-country race. It's not nicely laid out, right? It's not just this nice little oval, and we count how many laps we go and, and that sort of thing. But we are running this race with all kinds of things that trip us and snare us, that, that distract us and take us off course. Well, this is kind of what we're going to be talking about here when we get back to Pilgrim's Progress and, and Christian. Uh, Christian, when we last saw him last week, um, he, was, he finally made it to the cross, he got to the cross of Christ and this burden of sin that he's been carrying. Uh, this shame, this guilt that he was cu uh, uh, carrying all this time, uh, trying to be good enough, trying to make it on his own. Finally, at the foot of the cross, it rolls off. It rolls off, we're said, and it rolls into this tomb, and it is never seen again. At the cross, Christian gets forgiveness. He gets imparted righteousness. He has an assurance of his citizenship, his adoption into the family of God. He, he can get to the heavenly city with, with, with pride because he's now on the right road. He's, he's run up to this point in the race. And for the first time, he is experiencing a freedom, which is quite interesting because he just sang about freedom. Not a coincidence, I don't think. For the first time, he's been walking down this narrow way, right? Been trying to get to where he needs to go. But finally, Christian is experiencing a freedom. Describe freedom to me. What does that look like for you? Think of a time when you experienced freedom. Something that you, you could do whatever you want and when you wanted it. Sometimes it's hard for us to imagine, isn't it? A time with, without responsibilities, a time without something always weighing us down and something we've got to get to. 
I, I kind of thought, you know, through, through maybe the, uh, our lifetimes, I thought, you know what, maybe when we first got to ride a bike, there was a time of freedom there. I know when our girls have been learning to ride bikes, they just can't wait to get on that bike because it means freedom to them. They can start heading around the block. They can go to the park. They can head wherever they want to because it's freedom to them. Can I go ride my bike? Yeah. Hey, it's a big old world. I can ride my bike anywhere. Think about maybe when we got our driver's license, right? That was freedom, right? I, I lived about two blocks from the school, but every day I begged my mom to drive the car because I had my license, and it meant freedom. I could drive. It was amazing, right? It was senseless, idiotic, really. But you know what? I still did it and blessed my mom for doing it, right? Freedom. Do we understand what that freedom looks like, what, how that feels anymore? Because sometimes when we think about the, the, the Christian life, all we think about are the restrictions. We think about thou shalt not, and yeah, there's no fun, right? It's just, it's more of a, a, a killjoy. It's not a sense of freedom. But I think we miss out exactly on what this race is all about. I think there's restrictions because we have to, we are called to enjoy what is intended for joy. And to keep away from the things that are to cause us harm, to cause us hurt, and others, and to cause pain. And so sometimes we think of this, this race that we are running um, as, as restrictive. Now, why can't I just run off somewhere? I, I used to play, a, um, uh, it, was a, it was a quadding game, an ATV game on, on my PlayStation. I don't know, anybody, crazy video game players? Um, and every once in a while, if you veered off the course too much, right? You always try to do that as a kid. If you veer off too much, it will actually restart you back on the path. It just kicks you back over. And you're like, what? There was something really cool over there. I want to go see it. And we think that that's a problem, but it's actually for our benefit. Because we, have a, we are to run the race and the course is set out for us. And instead of seeing that as a good thing, we see it as restrictions, and so we even have to endure this, this idea and to get our mindset around the fact that these aren't restrictions, these are freedoms. I can do what I want within those parameters so that I'm not going to get hurt and I'm not going to hurt somebody else. Because if I'm not running the race in the way that God wants me to, I'm going to hurt somebody else. I'm going to drag them down with me. Right? Can, can you imagine? Have you ever seen those, those, those bike wrecks, like the, you know, the Tour de France or whatever it is? And all of a sudden, one person does one little beep, and there's a pile of people. Carnage everywhere, right? And we're like, he was just doing his thing. Come on. Can't blame the guy, right? But he just did a little nudge. I'm just going to go this way, and, and it was just wreckage. And so there's a race that we are to run, and we are to run it in the way that God has called us to do it. Otherwise, there's going to be wreckage. There's going to be carnage. There's going to be consequences. It's not that God gives up on us. It's not that says, you know what? You're, you're good. You're not, you can't participate anymore. Go off to the sidelines. He says, no, no. There's going to be consequences. You've got to clean this up and get back onto that race. It's this idea of endurance. Even when things don't work out. Even when our bad choices have bad consequences. We must have endurance to keep going. And see God's plan. Endurance is the key. This, this great life if you don't weaken. We are to run it and to run it in order to win the prize. And so Christian, he's left the foot of the cross. Burden is off him. You remember this story from last week. He, he finally comes a little bit and he encounters three sleeping individuals. Simple sloth and presumption. We went over them last week. But they're just, just feet from the cross and they're already asleep. Right? Not a great picture. And then he leaves them behind because they don't want to be woken up. They don't want to have anything to do with this race. And he, he actually starts walking down the path, heading towards a celestial city. We're actually told um, that there's walls on either side. Do I? Oops. Sorry, Tammy. I think we've got some pictures. I should be. I got to get. If you could just get into my mind, Tammy. Just, just, yeah. Um, so Christian's walking down the path, and there's actually walls on either side, right? to protect the borders, to, to, to mark out the race, if you will. And then all of a sudden, Christian sees these two individuals uh, just hopping over the wall. They're just tumbling over the wall and onto this narrow path. These two individuals, we are told, uh, are, are by the names of uh, formality and hypocrisy. Formality and hypocrisy. And right away, Christian, who's been going on this path for some time, he's like, what up? What are you guys doing? You can't just tumble over the wall like this. What, what, what's happening? 
And they say, you know, don't worry about, you know what, my family, our families have been doing this for thousands of years. No big deal. Don't worry about it. They say, you know what, we're actually from a city called Vainglory. And you know what, it is so far away from the wicket gate that we just kind of do this shortcut. It's, it's no big deal. It's all right. What's the big deal, right? We're on the same path as you are now. And, and Christian says, no, this doesn't sit right with me because I had to come in at the gate and you didn't. What, what's happening here? And so they start to kind of argue a little bit about things. Let me ask you, have you ever been cut off by somebody? Right? You've been waiting in line for a long time to, to get through a door or to get an item or to get a checkout or something like that. And then all of a sudden you get that person who just kind of comes in and out. Right? And then all of a sudden they're like, hi. And you're like, dude, where's the line's back there? Right? And you get a little perturbed because they didn't come in the right way. You get, you get a little, little perturbed. It just bugs you, doesn't it? For runners in a race, imagine running Olympic races again. You've trained, you've beaten your bodies, and, and you, just, you see the finish line, and you just truck into the end, and all of a sudden somebody just pops out of the stands, out of their seat, and they just join in, and they break the, the, you know, the little ribbon, and they're like, yay, you know, pretzels falling off them. Yay. You'd be a little upset, wouldn't you? Dude, like, again, the race started around this track here. Or, or you know, that doesn't sit well with us. We often hear that about the controversies of, of the ever-controversial steroids, don't we, in sports. What some have trained their entire lives for, for endurance and, and to build up strengths and all this. And all of a sudden somebody just does a few little injections and they just get this whole other, you know, it's a shortcut. There are no spiritual steroids. There are no, I don't even know how to say this, there's no butters. Is it butters when somebody butts in line? Is it butt or bud? Is, oh, budge. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. There are no budgers on the narrow way. We cannot be the, the formalist and, and, and the hypocrisy. We can't just jump the fence wherever you want. And so, and so Christian actually reprimands these two who try to tumble over the wall, and they haven't come through the gate. He tells them this. He says, you came in by yourselves without his word, and you shall go out by yourselves without his mercy. You can't just, just because you think you're on the way, just because you've kind of stumbled upon the path, it's not the proper way. It's not what God has intended. He's got a race for us, a race to run. In fact, this little scenario is actually a, a John Bunyan's way of poking a, a little bit of, of a dig at the, the Anglican church of the day. If you know the story of John Bunyan at all, um, he was actually from the Puritan tradition an Anglican church was the church of the state. And, uh, and if you didn't have the proper license in order to preach, um, you could be in lots of trouble, and that's what took place. The Anglican church did not want to license John Bunyan as a Puritan preacher. And so they actually imprisoned him for 12 years because of that. Uh, and so he's, he's got a bit of an ax to bear, an ax to grind, so to speak. Um, but even more so than that, uh, as the story goes, he, he saw a lot of... Uh, formality, a lot of hypocrisy in the church of that day, and we still have it today. You know, things don't change all that much. But he saw a lot of people who, for them, the Christian life was just a, it was a part of their lives. It was just something that was uh, you know, a formal attire that they put on, very much as, as, as hypocrisy was just, you know, of course, it was a respectable thing to be a part of the, the church of England at that time. It never reached their heart. They had never came in through that gate of Christ. They just kind of put on the suit and got on the narrow way. And they didn't come in at the door with that relationship with Jesus. Finally, Christian asks, before he kind of speeds ahead of these two individuals, he asks them this question, will your practice stand trial by law? Will your practice stand trial by law? Obviously, he's, he's referencing the inevitability of all of us standing before God, the judge, the righteous judge. And when he judges us by his standards, by his law, and we are without a relationship with Christ, we have nothing to plead. We have nothing to stand on. And so Christian is saying, what you're doing isn't right. It's not going to stand up. It's not going to hold water. Formality and hypocrisy don't really seem to care, and they just, they just keep going. 
They think he's a fool. They think he's wasted his time by having to come in at the gate, and, and, and they just basically leave him be. And so Christian kind of toddles off by himself. And, uh, and before long, he actually, they get onto the trail, which arrives at the foot of the hill difficulty. I don't know if you can see the, the pictures I've, I've kind of picked out for this week are okay. Uh, I can always try to find betters that would sort of uh, explain, paint a better picture of this. But, but all three, formless hypocrisy and Christian, get to the, the, the hill difficulty. Anybody ever been to the hill difficulty? Anybody been there? Some of us have season, season passes for, yeah, hill dif- the, the water slides at hill difficulty. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that's where they're at. And uh, at, the, at the foot, there's actually three paths. You can kind of see it a little bit. There's one that goes off to the left, one goes to the right, and then one that actually goes over the hill difficulty. Well, I don't know if you can see from the picture, but in the story, there is a, a spring, a fresh spring that is at the foot of the hill of difficulty. And Christian says, you know what, it's going to be a big climb, so I better refresh myself. And he stoops to drink of this fresh water. And as he does, uh, before too long, uh, formality takes off. And he sees the path on the left. He says, well, oh, so, you know, it's pretty carved out, and uh, it's pretty flat, and I'm just going to go this way. And so he starts to go around the left-hand side of the hill of difficulty. He says, of course, it's going to have to bring around to the back, and we're all going to meet together. So formality heads off to the left hypocrisy he's got the same mindset and he heads off to the right we're actually told that the one to the left is called the path of danger the one to the right is the path of destruction and Bunyan writes that formality and hypocrisy I never heard from again instead of seeing the difficulty as 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 a challenge as a time to persevere as a time to endure They head off on the easy roads. The easy roads, and they are lost. And they are lost, never to be found again. How many times do we do that? How many times, and rather than heading over that hill of difficulty, we want to go around it? We try to find another path. We try to find some other solution, because I just don't want to go through that. But sometimes when we get sidetracked, sometimes when we get distracted, at the end of it all, we feel even worse. Maybe we're in a a worse situation than we ever started off with because we wanted the the easy way. But sometimes there's difficulties in our lives that are there to help us to grow, to grow in that endurance, to grow in that perseverance. And most of us would probably say, well, we would never wish for something like that. We'd never pray for something like that. We'd never wish these things upon our worst enemies. And yet these are things that are going to help us ultimately. That will help us ultimately. And so unlike the two that go around or are never heard from again, Christian heads up over the hill. He in fact finds that once he's on it, the hill isn't as bad as he thought it was. He was starting to make some progress, and he's starting to get a foothold, and he's starting to get his way. In fact, halfway up the hill, he finds that the Lord of the land has made a little rest stop, a little arbor that is there with with shade and at a time for refreshment, and he takes a little sit down to kind of catch his breath, if you will. But in fact, he takes a little too long in that place. You begin to see on the right-hand side that he actually falls asleep. A place on the hill of difficulty that was just meant to take a break, to take a rest. He actually abuses it and falls asleep. How many of us have ever stopped to take a breather? How many of us have ever stopped to take a breather from a busy life? A a, a hectic life, a hectic ministry calling. And then we, we take the summers off and then all of a sudden we find out it's December already. Maybe we've rested a little too much. And we've kind of gotten off that race that we were called to be. It was supposed to be just a pit stop where we filled up on fuel and changed the tires. And instead it just became a sit down. A time of sleeping. Sometimes it's so hard for us to gain that momentum back. I was talking with an individual this week about uh, taking a year off after high school. Right? That's kind of the, the thing that everybody wants to do is just take that year off of high school. I said, you know what, that's going to be the hardest year after that year to gain that momentum back, to get back into things, right? It's not that it's a bad idea, but you know what, it's hard. It's hard when you get out of the system of things. And Christian finds this on his his, uh, journey as well. 
right? He's been climbing. He stops for rest. He falls asleep. Um, when he finally awakes, he, he bolts up, and he's like, I can't believe I fell asleep. And he starts to race up the hill once again. But once he's at the top of the hill, he actually finds out that he's lost his scroll of assurance. You can kind of see it on the bottom left-hand corner of the picture of him sleeping. He's lost that scroll that he needs to get into the celestial city. He's rested a little too long. And so he has to head back to that rest stop. He's now lost time. He's now started off his journey in the light, in the day, and now he's going to have to catch up time in the night, in the dark. There was consequences to this. He had left something very precious behind, and he had to go back. We had uh, uh, friends of ours um, that actually had left a child behind at a gas station. Ever had that? Like a road trip? Well, somebody heads off to the bathroom. You don't do a head count, right? And all of a sudden, uh, yeah, you get a few miles down the road, and we're like, where's Bobby? Mm-hmm. Eh, whatever, right? And so they had to go back, and they lost about a half an hour by the time they had to go back, and not to mention the, you know, the, the counseling bills after. But, right, there was something that was lost, something that was precious that was lost, and so Christian is feeling this, and he's feeling regret. He's feeling shame. It's not far from the cross. He's lost all that. But all of a sudden, because he is not running the race as he should, it starts to pack up on him once again. So he heads back, finds a scroll. He heads back up onto the mountain. And, uh, and he, he finally gets to the top. And he's trying to make his way. Now it's dark. It's a little hard to, uh, uh, to see. But he runs into two more individuals. Two more individuals, and their names are, are Timorous and, um, where are they? Timorous and Mistrust. Thank you. I lost my place there for a second. I got off on these tangents. Uh, mistrust, and they are actually running the opposite direction. They're going back down the hill of difficulty, and they're yelling something about lions, lions on the way, lions on the road, lions, turn back, save your life. There's just nothing but problems ahead. And, and Christian, he, he, he can't. He knows if he goes back, it's just more problems. He's got to head back to the city of destruction. And he says, you know what? I have to keep going. I have to persevere. I have to see what's going on. It's getting darker and darker. To head back is just going to cause more problems. And so he just keeps going forward. He keeps going forward. He's not sure what's really up ahead, what the story is of all these lions. But as he gets a little closer, he sees actually a building. And in front of the building are two lions. Two lions that are, are roaring and, and making all kinds of dreadful noises and making such a fuss. And Christian is not sure what to do. He stops in his tracks. How many of you ever had an experience with a dog like that? Right? I visited many farmyards in my day and, and you open the door and all of a sudden some big slobber and mutt comes out and you're like, shut the door. Is he friendly? Is he not friendly? How far does that chain actually go? Right? How far, how fast can he run? Uh, you try to go through all these different things. And so Christian's kind of, you know, measuring up the, the, the scenario here. And then all of a sudden, a character in the house by the name of Watchful calls out to him. He calls out to the Christian and he says, Is thy strength so small? Fear not the lions, for they are chained and are placed there for the trial of faith where it is and for the finding out of those that have none. Keep in the midst of the path, and no hurt shall come unto you. We find out that as Christian proceeds down that middle path, they are indeed chained. They can make all the noise they want. They can pull and snarl and do all kinds of ravenous things, but if he keeps in the middle, no harm will come to him because he is protected even from these roaring lions, even from these, these signs of fear that mistrust and timorous took off running from. But they didn't take that step of faith to endure and to persevere. And so Christian makes it through the middle of the path. He makes it soundly uh, to the palace called Beautiful. And that's where we're going to pick up our story next week. But the story of Christian's endurance today is filled with different characters. Different characters that was quite amazingly, as I began to go through it, fit so much into Paul's words here of encouragement and challenge to the church at Corinth. Upon Christian's uh, path, a, a journey of the day, we found some that were sleeping. 
We found some that were cutting in and shortcuts and trying to cut off the journey and make their own way through. We found others that were running backwards, heading back in a different direction, going in a different place altogether. The kind of thought of of the Israelites as they were coming out on the the Exodus road, how, how much they bemoaned wanting to go back to Egypt because there they had food and vegetables galore. Apparently they forgot the slavery they were under the burdens that they were under, but they wanted to go back. But Paul here teaches that we are to endure, to persevere. That's what the Christian life is about, that we are to persevere in our Christian life and in our witness. Paul starts off by saying that we are to exercise self-control in all things, that we are to discipline our bodies. We must know that self-control is part of the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? It's not something we conjure up ourselves. It's not some self-help scheme. This is something that comes from the spirit of how we are to exercise self-control, discipline ourselves so they're not falling asleep, so that we're not getting off track, that we're not trying to find shortcuts, that we're not running in the opposite direction. We must have perseverance when it comes to self-control. Paul warns in 1 Thessalonians, the church of Thessalonica, that we as Christians are to, to be children of the light, that we are in fact to be walking during the day. But what happens when we fall asleep in the light? When we fall asleep in the day, then we become people who have to journey in the dark. This is what we are to have self-control not to do, to make progress when we are to making progress, to run that race when we are called to do it. We can also think of the, the disciples with Jesus who go off into the garden to pray. Jesus goes off and he comes back. How many times? To find his disciples asleep. Can you not watch with me just one hour? Jesus asked them. I need you. I need you. Again, the the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, and so we must discipline our bodies, even our physical being sometimes to discipline, to have self-control so that we're not lazy or slothful, the little too much folding of the hands, but that we must run that race. We must spread that message. We must do the work that God has prepared for us in advance. Paul also warns us us against running aimlessly, beating the air, right? This this idea of shadow boxing. There's not even a, a, a person there. But this was the the story of formality and and hypocrisy. They just kind of entered wherever they want. They were aimless. This is just way easier. I don't have to go back to the starting point. I can just hop in wherever I want. They were just beating the air. They weren't even fighting an opponent. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They made up their own race. They entered wherever they want. They'll exit wherever they want. But we are not to be aimless in this race. We must enter at the proper way, and we must follow the race that is set out for us. We can think of the, uh, the character Judas, one of the very disciples of Christ, one of the twelve, and yet who was the one who betrayed him in the end? Was he just a formalist? Was he just playing the part of a disciple? Or was he just completely off the, the race altogether? But the race is marked out. Maybe you don't know the race for yourself, what that looks like for you. Pray for direction this week. Ask God, what is that next leg of the journey? What is that next step in the race? Where am I supposed to go from here? What does that look like? Pray for hearts of productivity. Pray for pure hearts, that you're not just going through the motions of the Christian faith. A couple months ago, I had a bit of a a personal struggle myself, and and I was trying to figure out, am I doing things for myself? Am I doing things for for my church? Or am I doing things for God? What's my motivation? Am I doing things because I really love God? Because that should be my primary focus above all things. And so I actually did some research, and I have a little sticky note that's on my desk, and saying, what does it mean to love God? And it was just a sort of a list of things that I'm checking things off and saying, okay, this is good. I'm doing it for God. I'm not doing it for myself to promote myself. I'm not just doing it so that we can have just a wonderful and great time. 
that I'm doing things for God first and foremost. It's not just a, a, a formality. So I'm not a hypocrite in these things. That first and foremost, I'm doing it for God. Paul even goes on to say that we should, we should guard ourselves. He's putting himself in that position. That we would guard against the way that we are running and training and disciplining ourselves. Not to be aimless. In fact, he says, lest after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. He's making it personal to himself. I can preach the greatest message in the world, but if I'm not living my own life in a way that is worthy of God, running my own race personally, everything else falls apart. And so Paul knew this. It wasn't just promoting discipline and self-control, but practicing it himself. That he cannot turn back, that he must push forward. Jesus uh, uses the statement, remember Lot's wife. And the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's wife who was to flee and not look back. Don't even turn back. But she does and she turns into a pillar of salt because she almost desirous of the things that were behind her. I thought of the other story of, of Elisha. who Elisha was being called by the prophet Elijah to sort of be apprenticed under him to take uh, sort of the mantle from him once uh, Eli- Elijah took off in his fiery chariot. We get the story of Elisha who is actually plowing in a field when Elijah calls him. And the amazing part of that story is that what Elisha does is right away he breaks up the plow, he makes a fire, and he kills his oxen so that he cannot go back farming. He's wrecked his tractor is what he's done. And he says, you know what, God has called me to something different, and that's now what I'm going to do. This is the race that God has set out before me. So he kills his tractor, and he says, yes, I'm all yours. I'm not going back. I can't go back. I've destroyed that. I've burned it down. Paul is saying we cannot go back. We must move forward. We must endure and persevere. I found an amazing uh, quote this week um, in Isaiah chapter 7, and it reads this, If you are not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. If you're not firm in the faith, you'll be not firm at all. This was a challenge to Israel because they thought themselves so mighty and good and powerful, and yet they were nothing when it came to their relationship with God. And the challenge of the prophet Isaiah was if you're not firm in the faith, you're not firm at all. It just doesn't matter. We can beat our, beat our, uh, build our bodies and beat ourselves and discipline ourselves, but if, if our goal, if our aim isn't for God and His glorification, we run that race in vain we run it in vain keep awake run the race god has set before us trust in him and don't look back difficulties are going to come trouble's going to come paul says if you want to live a godly life you will be persecuted it's not all rose colored there's challenges that are going to come but we need to persevere romans says that even suffering can be a good thing Because suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance uh, produces character. Character produces hope. The hope that we're celebrating of Advent, of a life lived out for Christ. I'm going to close with a story that um, I just found yesterday, actually. I don't know if we have that, that picture on the end. Last, uh, one of the other things that led to a very scary world was a, a shooting that took place at a Planned Parenthood um, a facility in, in Colorado. And uh, there was an officer that was shot and killed there. What you'll see on, the, on the, uh, your right-hand side there is a, a lady by the name of uh, Rochelle Swasi. And she's actually the widow of this officer that was shot, uh, shot down um, in that And I thought this just kind of really summed up this running the race to win of a Christian life. Uh, Let me just explain, uh, read a little bit of the story. Um, When she came to speak at this, uh, her husband's funeral, she thanked the community for their support, saying, I have been more overwhelmed this week by love than by sadness. Your kindness is an amazing gift to me. It said, Rochelle then said her husband left two words to this world. Two words to this world. Elijah and Faith. It says that these are the names of the Swasi's two children. 
She explained that Elijah means the Lord is God, and faith means an assurance of things unseen. She explained these two words point to all my husband had to say to this world. Put your faith in the Lord. She described her husband as a man who believed in a God who rescues. Garrett strove, quote, Garrett strove to point to eternal life through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, end quote. This was a man who lived his life for Jesus. This is a man who ran the race to win. And the legacy he left behind to his wife, these two kids, he ran it, he won it. Even in the end of a horrible, tragic situation, that nobody would ever want this for, for his wife, for his widow, for his kids. And yet through this witness, others have come to know this. You and I have come to know this thousands of miles from, from Colorado. And yet we celebrate this life of a man who ran the race of his Savior to win. May we all be like that. We're going to celebrate communion here. I'm going to ask uh, the elders that are uh, with us here this morning to uh, join me up at the front. And really, the communion table itself represents a, a bit of the, uh, the race, if you will, of Christ himself. And the beginning of that journey was in that manger so many years ago. Jesus had a course. He had a race that was set out before him. He had appointed times to do things. We see that throughout the Gospels. And then we begin to see the culmination of things that led up to the cross. His sacrifice, his life given for us so that we would know God's love. His race began in the manger. His race, so to speak, ended at the cross a symbol of his love and sacrifice for us this morning the communion table the, the bread and the cup symbolize Jesus' life his, his death for us his sacrifice for us and if you are